Good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, my name is Steve Chapman, and I'm the president of the Ottawa branch of the National Association of Federal Retirees. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the office of the Ottawa branch, the National Association of Federal Retirees, is located is traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. On behalf of the branch, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar called Pain Hurts, But What Can I Do About It? I want to give a warm welcome to our presenter today, my friend, Dr. Hillel Feinstone. Dr. Feinstone is a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. He's a professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Ottawa and director of the Stroke Rehabilitation Research at the Elizabeth Briere Hospital. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning, Dr. Feinstone. Today's session will focus on learning about different types of pain, teaching you how to better discuss pain with your doctor and understanding how different factors like sleep, exercise and diet can impact recovery. Veuillez noter que le webinar sera présenté en anglais, mais la participa participation bilingue est toujours encouragée. I want to give a special welcome to anybody here who is not yet uh, a member of the association. We hope these webinars will inspire you to join us. And to all our members in the audience, I hope you will help us grow by participating in our annual mega recruitment drive. Every time you successfully recruit a member, you will be entered into a draw to win some amazing prizes, including two grand prizes of a $10,000 travel voucher and $5,000 cash each, courtesy of Colette and Bel Air Direct. We'll make sure to give you all the contest details in the follow-up email uh, that we'll send out after the webinar. Finally, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions for Dr. Feinstone, please type them into the Q&A box in Zoom and, and we'll read them out at the end and Dr. Feinstone will, uh, will answer them. Now, thank you for your patience. Uh, we don't want to make you wait any longer, so I'll hand over the presentation to Dr. Feinstone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and thank you, Steve. Uh, met Steve uh, about a year ago. It would be a wonderful uh, uh, person to meet and he's uh, well representing your organization. So I'm Hal Feinstone. I, I sort of make a joke. I'm, I, I'm live from the world headquarters of TL Foodies in Toronto. And my daughter said, but you should say it's, it's her home and it's her living room right now. And this is where she uh, practices her art of uh, being a food influencer. So this is real background actually. So our, our topic today is Pain hurts, but what can I do about it? I've given a lot of lectures to uh, the more academic crowd, and this was a challenge and an honor to present this to uh, a, a group like yourselves, and in which, like I said to Steve, I, I am a, a, a proud proud future member of, and, um, and uh, trying to distill so, so many aspects of what pain is, and so we wrote here, muscle pain, joint pain, back pain, emotional pain, what, what, which is which, and trying to understand some of the different, different factors that could influence your pain. Next slide, please. So uh, you always do objectives in medicine in any talk that you give, and I think it's a good idea to distill down what we want to say. And so we said that we would like at the end that, uh, you guys would understand a bit about different kinds of pain. Um, <laughs> better advocate for yourselves, uh, complain better to your doctors and families. And uh, of course, putting a plug in some of the research that I've done, one thing called the pain explanation and treatment diagram, which I've used over the last couple of decades, uh, both in the office and trying to use it as well now for patients to explain themselves and to others uh, their pain. So um, I, I was going to say at the end, if someone says to you that they have the answer to pain or they're going to tell you everything about a pain, I had another slide that I didn't put in today. And basically it said, if that person says they know everything about pain or how to explain to you, there's one thing to do, run away from that person. 
because it's a complicated topic and it's a complicated area and no one has all the answers. And that's why there's so many practitioners of pain and people who say they are doing something about pain and, and are and are not and a lot of medications. And so maybe that will come up in some of the questions later on. So let's just talk about a few basic cases and then we'll get into a more complicated case that of what I see. So next slide, please. So for you, if you're going to your office, this is one thing that we teach medical students and we teach residents to how to describe pain. So I just thought I've been doing this a little bit that I thought it'd be a good idea just to tell you. So if you're going into your doctor and you're wanting to explain your pain, how do you do that? So this is one method that's well used in all of medicine all around, around the world, of course, in the English world. So it's called the PQRSTU method. So it's a way for you to explain your pain. So basically, it's the P stands for the pain. And you know, when you're describing it, so the doctor's going to want to know What's the quality of the pain? Is it tingling? Is it burning? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it gripping? Because tingling may be associated, for instance, more with um, a, a nerve pain, maybe in your neck, or some severe arthritic type pains could sometimes have tingling. Burning is also associated with sometimes uh, issues in neck and back. So that's why you'd want to know about the quality. And radiation, what does that mean? It means where's the pain traveling to? Does it travel? So if a pain starts in the neck and travels down to the fingertips, that's going to be different than if a pain stays in the neck. Tingling down the neck into the fingertips could mean a pinched nerve. Something's called a radiculopathy. So just something to and how to explain. So you could think about, does my pain travel? The severity, what does that mean? It's like, how severe is it? Nothing of these, none of these are absolutely indicative indicative of one kind of pain. But if it wakes you up at night, sometimes, for instance, rotator cuff pain in the shoulder does seem to wake people up at night more. Um, and certain headaches, unfortunately, like a brain tumor, could actually wake you up at night with a severe headache. Just something to think, okay, timing, you know, when is the pain happening? If it's happening more positional, when you lift the arm in a certain way, you think more that it would be more a muscle or a ligament compared to something else is worse in the morning. Certain uh, rheumatoid arthritis is, for instance, is uh, cause you to be stiff in the morning. And then you sort of unthaw, you thaw out uh, and later on. If it's worse in the evening, then maybe that's uh, the type of arthritis called osteoarthritis because then you have sort of, you're, you're putting pressure on that joint and it's going to be worse with the wear and tear of the day. And then uh, um, under what circumstances, another way, like, so when is this happening? Um, why do we say shaving there? Because for instance, shaving, when you're just a little bit of bending your back, that seems to be different than just sitting like I am now, then that sometimes certain back pains uh, could be worse with shaving. And when you're jogging, you're pounding your heels. So then um, there could be a pain in the back actually with jogging because you're force is transmitted from the heel into back. So things like that. So this is for you, PQRSTU. Think about it when you're going to your doctor, maybe jog it down, jot it down on a piece of paper so you could uh, sort of be a little bit more organized, especially in this day and age of one problem, five minutes with your doctor. Next, please. So a couple of cases just to get under thinking about some things and not to, I, I, I have this, for instance, at a nurse practitioner's course and some, and some uh, medical student course. So I cut them back. So basically just like, it's like short snappers, uh, an 89 year old man, uh, he lifts a pail and he's now in pain. And he says it's between his shoulder blades. And oh, by the way, I was also treated for prostate cancer. So there's different things in medicine. We're not here to solve everyone's problem today, unfortunately. But the idea is that when you have a certain pain, the doc this is what the doctor's thinking is thinking. Okay, there's muscles between the shoulder blades. So that could be, it could be just a muscle strain. There's uh, the muscles around the ribs, chest walls could be strained. But then also when you're lifting something and you're a little older, you can get a compression fracture, which means a fracture of the vertebra, vertebra. And then unfortunately, you, you have to, that's why the doctor is going to say, did you ever have a history of cancer? Did you have any other, uh, other medical problems? So that because other things 
could then spread, for instance, to the vertebra, and that could be the cause of the pain rather than the actual lifting. Next slide. A uh, 65-year-old female, she's around the corner on Wellington Street, and she's going to the dance academy, and she says, you know, my knee hurts and swells, and it's on and off for two years. It's not killing me, but it's something that's really affecting me when, when I'm more active, now more often when I'm walking. So again, the thing that a doctor, the, the, the term he or she uses is called differential diagnosis, which means we're always thinking what are the different things that could cause knee pain and swelling um, in a person on and off. And so, of course, the first thing we would think about is what's called osteoarthritis. That's kind of the wear and tear arthritis of the knee. There are other things that could cause pain if you're, I was going to say, if you're lucky enough, if they, that just the kneecap, that's what the patella is called. And uh, there's certain things of the kneecap that, that could cause pain. And then the idea that sometimes you may feel that there's pain in one part of the body, like the hip or the knee, and it actually could be coming from a, the joint above or the joint below. So we always teach our residents and medical students, think of the joint above and the joint below. For instance, sometimes hip arthritis could present, could lead to a person thinking initially that they have some knee pain. So here's a picture, the next slide, just um, uh, just of what we're talking about in knee osteoarthritis. On the left, we actually took a, that the beauty, the beauty of Google images, we took a picture of, uh, from somewhere else on a, a healthy knee, as it shows on the left here, you see there's a, there's a thigh bone, and then there's that kneecap in the middle, which is also called a patella, and in between the thigh bone and the knee bone, uh, which is called the tibia. There's that disc. It's called the cartilage. And on the left, uh, on the right, unfortunately, is what can happen. You see some of that nice pearly um, um, cartilage could become a little eroded, a little broke down. It kind of happens with time, but some people get it more than others. Runners, people do pound their knees a lot. Some jobs may get a bit more of that, what's called there, show some cartilage loss. And then there's things called bone spurs, which are little bits of bone that will happen when the knee gets uh, arthritic. And you can see there's less of a space between the upper bone and the lower bone. That's called joint space narrowing. Okay, next slide, please. This is our last sort of short snappers uh, case before we go to a little bit more complicated things that I've seen as a physiatrist. So this person, is about, she's 70 plus, and she says, my neck hurts when I turn to the right. And then we, we always sit. So that's where this radiating pain, we said, the R of the PQRST. So, so we ask, is it going anywhere? She says, as a matter of fact, yeah, when I turn my neck, I'm getting some tingling uh, down my arm. Um, and, and did you have any other weakness in any part of your body, Mrs. Smith? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, actually, my uh, uh, my leg seems a little weaker, too. I, I don't know. That seems crazy. Um, so don't be shy in giving some of your some of these symptoms that you, that you may have, because sometimes they do make sense. And for instance, you could just. It could just be neck osteoarthritis, but of course, if this was in my office, we would think, okay, something else. It's, just, it's not just the neck. There's the arm. There's some tingling, some feeling, some what we call sensory symptoms in the arm. What else could be? Could there be some pinched nerve in the neck? Could there be some um, uh, uh, compression of the spinal cord? Hmm. And we would also ask, is there any bowel or bladder trouble? That's always a question that any doctor should and would ask about a neck problem or a back problem. Why? Because if there's some pinching of <coughs> some of the contents inside the neck, we call the spinal cord and can, spinal canal, then that could cause some peeing or pooping problems that you have less control. So let's look at the next slide just to give us a little picture of what we're talking about. So this is um, for me looking at my side and just slicing through, taking away the skin, taking away the fat, and this is what's inside the neck. So inside the neck is that tube called the spinal cord. And if you had something with the related to your disc, which is that same thing like that cartilage that we saw on the knee, but this is in the neck, it could have some pinching. And that all of a sudden, just some arthritis of the neck could translate into some not only just the arthritis, but some pinching of the stuff that's in the in the neck, which is 
a spinal cord and some other nerves. And all of a sudden, then it would make sense that someone was having some peeing problems, that they were having less ability to control or having some tingling and numbness in the hand. Complicated stuff, but just to get an overview. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is my life. Uh, uh, was was my life and doing this pain now and, and uh, a lot of more from the first lecture that we did here with the National Association on Stroke Rehabilitation. But um, this has been a big part of pretty much any physiatrist. Physiatrist, as we said in the first lecture, is the same thing, P-H-Y-S-I-A-T-R-I-S-T, a specialist in physical medicine rehabilitation. And you almost can't get out of seeing people with pain and weakness in our society. And even though other specialists also will see like an orthopedic surgeon, like a neurologist, like a rheumatologist, but a physiatrist is someone who may see um, different parts of the body, musculoskeletal, we use the word, um, uh, pain. So let's look at this case because it sort of introduces some of the concepts that I'm gonna talk about uh, today that could relate your pain and relate to how the mind and body relate to pain and don't explain all pain, but something to think about. So here we have a 52-year-old female, they've married, she's working as a software engineer, you know, relevant to Ottawa, which you have a bit of a, that kind of industry. And she really doesn't have much of a problems in terms of her medical health before. She has some migraine headaches, but she is otherwise pretty well. And she's just minding her own beeswax. She's at a, she's at a stoplight in her car and she notices a car coming. We asked that, like, did you anticipate this, miss? And she grips the steering wheel tightly, and all of a sudden, her car was hit about 40K. Not fast, not slow. Next slide, please. And she was shocked. So we looked at, I, I often, um, I'm, I'm telling you these things, like something that comes about over only a, a few years later in my practice, that when people use that word shock, it seems to mean something. There's something more than just having an accident. There was, there was a sort of an emotional aspect to this pain. And, and it's very common. You know, sort of, you're, in a, you're alone. You're in your car. It's a very private thing being in a car. You don't expect anything to happen. And so it's this shock, like your, in, your privacy is being invaded. We ask about loss of consciousness because, of course, you could you could get a head injury with your car. So we ask, did you, did you lose consciousness? Did your head bang something inside the car? And really, it's only like about three hours later that she started to notice more stiffness and pain. So again, it wasn't something immediate always. Sometimes when you're in shock, you don't notice things right away. But, you know, if you had a huge fracture and your arm couldn't move, then you probably wouldn't be three hours later. So this is just telling us maybe this is more muscles and ligaments. We'll get into that. She's noting some pain. She doesn't have the bowel, bladder incontinence. So thinking about that same thing we talked about before, the whether the spinal cord could be pinched. Doesn't seem like so. She goes to the emergency room. They don't think that there's something serious that needs to stay there. They put her on some Tylenol, some anti-inflammatories, things like you buy in the store, Motrin, you may get prescribed, Celebrex. And often the emergency room note, you got to remember in the emergency room, they're caring if you're dying or living. And that's the most important thing. So they'll give something that's not really a diagnosis, a little bit my bugaboo. They may just say STI, which stands for soft tissue injury, doesn't tell much. But they made that just to tell themselves and to others, okay, this is soft tissue. Another word for muscles and ligaments are soft tissues. Next slide, please. So the next morning, she's having more pain. She's, it's in the right and left neck, and it's in the left shoulder blade. And, uh, and she sees me or she sees even a family doctor. She's not a big complainer. She's, and she, and she's just getting more pain. It's increasing over the next four months and family doctor prescribed some stuff or she may have gone herself. You know, I think in COVID now people were able to self refer to physiotherapy. And so she said, you ask her, is it helping? It's, it's been helping Dr. Feinstone or Dr. Smith, but eh, not as much as I'd like. And she's done some acupuncture at either you know, some dry needling with the physiotherapy, which she finds some benefit. And uh, she's gone to a chiropractor, more temporary relief. Next slide, please. So I'm trying to give you the benefit of some other, some of, some of my thoughts over the years that probably I didn't uh, think about 
as much or at all in the beginning of my career. You know, what I often will ask, and it takes time, but what are some of the other things, Jennifer, that have happened since this accident? For instance, and, and maybe the person will even not know what to say, and they'll say, nothing, I'm not sure. So things to ask, even if you have a friend who was just in a car accident or a while ago, or a colleague, or a loved one, or wife or husband. Do you have a fear of driving, Jennifer? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm really, yeah, I don't like driving. I, I Sometimes though people will say a year later, I, I haven't driven since the accident. And then that really interesting thing that only I figured out a, 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 a year, a few, number of years after starting being a, a physiatrist, I have a greater fear of even being a passenger. And then it sort of doesn't seem to make sense. You know, um, you're a passenger and you have more pain. And then sort of pretty much when I ask my patients, pretty much everyone answers pretty much the same uh, answer. They say, well, when I'm driving, I at least have more sense of control of what I'm doing. When I'm a passenger, I have to think about the other person and whether they're safe. And um, so that's very common. I, have to look, I still have to look that up in the literature. Has anyone written about that? And then you ask sometimes about dreams. Are you dreaming more about the accident? Or what, a, what, a, what, what kind of dreams are you having? And, and so many stories that I've heard over the years. Um, yeah, I'm dreaming, it's still having these terrible nightmares. Uh, and sometimes it's about the accident itself, many times, the actual accident, dreaming about the accident, the collision that happened. But a lot of times it's also even worse. There's something about dreams and I, I've asked God a few times, he, She's sometimes she answers me and sometimes she doesn't. And um, and I say, why, why are they having dreams that are even worse? Like I always remember this one woman, she, she had dreams about um, dead children, that the children were, had died during the accident. And I said, did you see children? She says, yeah, their faces were in the mirror, in the um, glass of the car. But yet, I said, so I was really concerned that they had died. But she, she says, no, they, nothing happened to them. But for some reason, the dreams translated. So, and that's pretty uh, contributing to poor sleep and waking up and having... And then many times people will actually avoid the scene of the accident. They actually change their route. If they're in a small town, it gets even tougher. And uh, if they're in a larger city, not as hard, but they actually don't want to go nearby because that brings on a fear or a, a panic attack. Didn't even write that about panic attacks. And then there's sometimes conflicts with insurance companies. Now, these things take a long time to to ask about, and that's the problem sometimes with your family doctors, not having enough time. So that's why I'm bringing these up for you to for you to think about, to tell family members, you can ask them about these things, you know. And unfortunately, there are conflicts with insurance companies because they, you know, they want you to have a short um, uh, a short stay in the uh, in the insurance world and and a short a small amount of money to, and that's just their the, that's that's what they do for a living. Next slide, please. So she stopped working for about three weeks. This is that part of medicine called social, psychological, and she's working part time. Um, her boss is annoyed with her because th this is what happens when people, you know, they're, they're valued members of their the department, of their company. But I do find, I said specifically in this case here, that she's an excellent employee, and that helps when people are not excellent employees or they just started with their workplace that makes it harder because there's not as much um, sort of uh, that the, the boss may not feel as much loyalty to that person. And she's angry. She's angry at the person who hit her because I threw in a bunch of things in here because hit and run because the guy actually hit the, her vehicle and then was able to get out of the way and no one, no one found him again. And uh, again, this over the years, this was actually from Dr. Bessemin, who's a used to be the head of the armed forces, a physiatrist, and he was uh, doing some work actually for, at the time for a PhD called he, uh, "Perceived Injustice." And this is soldiers, for instance, who were coming home from b battle in Afghanistan and even many years ago, and uh, having PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and feeling that they're not being listened to. And for a while, you know, people had post-traumatic stress, the, like dreams and nightmares and anxiety after a trauma. Today's trauma, not as the average person doesn't go to war, but 
being in a car accident could be kind of like in a war. So that, that, that feeling that I'm not being treated properly by, my, by the insurance company, that the guy was a, a hit and run, that that is associated with more pain and more anxiety and more, probably more physical symptoms, which I'll talk about very soon. Let's go to the next slide. So on physical exam, I cut back a lot of things. She's tender. The main thing is that in, in the perfect case of muscle ligament pain, she's tender. It's the, the range of motion of the shoulder is good because certain diseases cause stiffness of the shoulder. There's something called frozen shoulder, which you can get in which you can't lift your arm up. And so that would be another co component of being in a car accident. She doesn't have weakness or loss of feeling because we said crunching of some of the nerves or the spinal cord nerve damage could cause some weakness or loss of feeling. So it seems like the pain is coming from her muscles and ligaments more. Next, please. These are the muscles and ligaments of the body. This is a, um, a famous uh, 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 textbook of anatomy. And we don't see this as much as like when we watch Gray's Anatomy. So that's why I put it there. It's, um, you know, when you go to a show when you see a show or when you go to the doctor's office usually you're seeing the ribs or the bones as you could see there is some a couple of but there is some bones but the muscles so complicated multiple muscles attaching to the cell to each cell each cell each other the, starting in the bottom there's like that large muscle on the bottom which, which um is the uh, uh, uh uh, latissimus dorsi and it goes all the way from the low back up into the shoulder so you could see sometimes why a pain starting in the low back may actually travel to the shoulder just on the basis of the muscles and ligaments very complicated next please so and then as a physiatrist and and every physician but some physicians more than others we want to know how's this pain causing problems or how's it leading to any problems in function that's and you may want to say to your father, your physicians, what's it doing to me? Because in, in her case, pain is worse with vacuuming. So in low back problems or neck problems, when you're just leaning forward a little bit, then uh, vacuuming could be one of the worst things. And you know, in this day and age, especially people working at home or with COVID, in the last few years, this week we we typed into you know Google uh, image uh, poor positioning in uh, with the computer with the laptop. So you, so my research assistant, she thought that's. I said, is that really that so bad? She says, yeah, it's terrible, Dr. Pine. So, so yeah, so I, th I think that we could agree that, uh, that that staying in that position for too long a time, if you had some, it could cause neck pain as, you know, you're tightening up the muscles and they're in a bad position for long periods of time. And if you had a neck pain due to a car accident or any injury, that being in that kind of situation could perpetuate the pain. Next, please. So there is a term called myofascial pain. I think years ago, less accepted for some reason in medicine. It's really only the last 30 years, 25 years that people are accepting like neurologists and orthopedic surgeons. For a while, it's just the bones, the nerves, that's it. And, you know, muscles and ligaments, as I showed you, they're so huge in forming how we look, our definition, but yet they weren't uh, accepted as much. Now, uh, my colleagues in neurology will say, okay, I don't think it's a nerve problem. I don't think it's a brain problem. I think it's a myofascial pain problem, which you see the definition of pain coming from the muscles and ligaments. Okay, maybe Dr. Feinstone or someone, or someone else should see this person now. Next, please. And so years ago, seeing these people, they're suffering, they had no uh, doubt as in at all that this pain was coming from their muscles and ligaments and they were in genuine pain, but still saying to myself, okay, okay, could other things have an impact, could play a role? Oh, just go back. Could other things have an impact or role in pain? So it just, again, Google image, you know, in my own book and in, you know, this was just an interesting uh, from journal. So could they be playing a role? Could could emotions, besides other factors, like we said, ergonomic factors like vacuuming, could, could they play a role in neck and shoulder pain and perpetuating them? Next slide, please. And um, I also said, so, so I'm not doubting that there is real muscle 
ligament pain, myofascial pain, but could there be other factors, other things that I could help my patients with, which could be both preventing or delaying a, 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 a complete healing and recovery of injured muscles and ligaments. So that's the, you know, millions of books. No, that, yes, next slide, please. Uh, that's that concept of the mind-body. And in the area of actual muscle ligament pain, it wasn't as big as I wanted to find. Uh, you know, there's lots of books about sort of the psychological aspects and whether the pain is psychological, but I really thought wanted to find articles and uh, that would look at that relationship between the physical pain, psychological factors, social factors, that if we could look at them, would provide more effective physical pain treatment. So we actually, as you see on the, on the right, we had a fellow and years ago um, in 2008, we actually published an article called Stress-Induced Physiologic Changes as a Basis for the Biopsychosocial Mental Pain. So we wanted to say, yeah, this is real pain. Are there factors? Is there any literature? So we actually, again, the whole lecture for lecture, I'll tell you like one thing, like they, for instance, took mice and injured the back of a mouse. And before they did that injury, they stressed the mouse. And how do you stress a mouse? You put them in a tube, like a toilet tissue tube, and they can become very, very stressed. It's called a restraint model. So you have this stressed mouse, then you make a little wound on their back, put a slide on them, they're still able to get around. And you do the same thing to another group of mice who are not injured, who are injured, but are not stressed, and they're allowed to have fun and have good games. And you follow that wound. And you see, does it make a difference if you're pre-stressed? Does the wound take as long? And how is the wound to recover? And no surprise to anyone, this woman, Dr. Janice Kiko Glazer in Ohio, she found that there's longer times of recovery in the mice that's stressed. So I think my patients and you can understand that. It makes sense. It's not just that someone's not coping well with the problem, with the pain, but there may actually be some physiology that will prevent the wound from healing as a result of psychological factors. So the idea of risk factors came about for pain. And, and we, we use that term and uh, it's kind of being used more often now. The idea is like, you know, there's smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension to us risk factors for stroke or heart attack. How about some pain risk factors for pain? And these are like factors predictive of chronic pain after a musculoskeletal problem. So that's, so, that, so that's how we develop then these pain risk factors, the idea. And then this thing called the pain explanation and treatment diagram, which I'm, I'm, I'm uh, presenting like to, to you, the in quotes, lay audience. So you'll understand for yourself and uh, we'll get it out there. So like, we just want a couple hundred million people now to understand this more. And I think as a result of the YouTube that Antoine developed, did for my stroke rehab, I have no doubt now. We're going, we're going for Antoine to think about I'd say 200 million people right now. That's a joke. Okay, let's try out this pain explanation and treatment diagram. What is that? So that is this thing that over the year, it started off in a plane when I sketched out to this, my luckily to the person next to me who was a graphic designer. And she said, I could do something that. She, she, uh, she, helped, she did an initial thing. And then someone in my hospital helped out who happened to be a graphic designer. And we designed this thing. We said, what can we do at this one page thing so that a person leaves the office with a real understanding of their discomfort, their problem. They could show it to their therapist. They could see it themselves so that we're not leaving just with a whole bunch of information and a bunch of gobbledygook. Okay, so as you'll see in the middle, it says diagnosis. It says habits, sleep, exercise, ergonomics, and other things that can affect. So why don't we actually and go to the next slide to see like an actual filling it out with our patient. So the idea is we could do it by hand. She, it was interesting, the graphic designer, I said, I'd like to have it on a computer, which we have, but never really successfully. She said, you know, I think it's actually the human touch, Dr. Feinstone, of, of actually doing that with the patient. The sheet's good, 
but she says maybe you should you should continue to uh, focus on that my goal was is actually to have say a t um a tablet that you could write on the tablet have next to the person i've done that uh, i've had some students at university of ottawa in the, the engineering department biomedical still if anyone's out there wants to work with me i do i think that would be great it's hard to get it going in our current medical system but the bottom line is we say okay what is your diagnosis because still that's the most important thing that's in the middle of the page diagnosis so i think mrs Smith, say Jennifer will call her, I think your pain is in the muscles and ligaments. On the far right, least beneficial thing of this uh, of this sheet is I don't think it's your bones, nerves, joints. That's a problem because if you've gone to other therapists and you, everyone has a theory. So I think your problem's in the muscles and ligaments. Instead of just saying it's in the muscles, ligaments, we try to identify of that picture before of the multiple muscles. Try to say it's not just everywhere. We pressed a lot of other muscles. We do something called palpation. And um, the pain's not everywhere. It seems to be more in these muscles called the parascapular, the trapezius. We had tried to identify which muscles we may show them in a diagram in the office, um, or maybe the physiotherapist can then show them and say, okay, so. Sometimes um, it's not a joke. We'd say the best treatment, as it shows in the top of the little box there, is the best treatment would be a muscle ligament tra transplant. I used to uh, stop there, but I realized that's not fair because people got a little excited. And so we say, we, but we can't do that. It's not crazy. We do if someone's heart, their liver, their kidney, there is the, there are muscle ligament, uh, uh, there are liver, kidney, heart transplants. We don't have really a muscle ligament transplant. If we could, Jennifer, take out your trapezius because it was injured during the car accident and put in a new trapezius, I think we could really improve your situation, but we can't do that now. So what are we talking about here? What are some of the pain risk factors? Things that we know could be really screwing up, aggravating, disturbing your pain, and some things also that maybe we could, if you put into place, could actually improve the healing and recovery of the pain. Are you with me, Jennifer? So then that's when maybe on a second visit, if it's your family doctor, and that's what we've been training family doctors to say, you don't have to do this all at once because it's sometimes overwhelming that uh, you say the next visit. So we look at some, what are some of the things that could be making a muscle ligament injury worse, affecting the healing, like that poor mouse that has that injury that was who was pre-stressed and the taking longer to cause a nice wound over the injury that was caused. So habits, smoking is actually an effect on circulation. Smokers don't heal as well. Alcohol, it's a neurotoxin. People are drinking way too much alcohol, not little amounts. There's, it's definitely a risk factor to not heal as well. Diet, used to skip over this is obesity. You don't want to say it because really, unfortunately, lately, there are more studies that say that people really uh, they're, uh, uh, overweight is causing more muscle ligament pain. And there are some associations from the simple thing, like if you're very heavy, you could put stress on your, say, knee joints versus other factors which you may not even understand that could lead to some aspects of, of healing and recovery. Sleep. So we ask the person to pick, is it poor? Is it not refreshing? Is it good? And of course, pain itself could lead to poor sleep. And then, but there's the concept of poor sleep could affect, if you don't sleep well, you feel like, you know what, it starts with SH first. And uh, so therefore, sometimes improving the sleep may actually uh, uh, um, enable you at least to then do some of the things that can help your pain like physiotherapy or exercise. So, so that's where sometimes some medications could play a role temporarily in improving uh, your sleep so that you could get on and do the things you want to do to improve your pain. Exercise, you know, the most common thing is people are not exercising enough. Um, feeling that you just feel like crap, you're not, you're tired, you may be in the mood, but that's the worst thing you could do. We know that getting in the pool, which seems to be one of the best things for post-accident neck pain and um, physiotherapy and yoga and other things. There, It's, it's not just um, um, 
you know, we, we, these are real concepts that you're improving the circulation, flexibility of the muscles, and not enough is the most common thing. Occasionally, you get a person who does too much, often a woman, um, a mother who's doing so many things for her family, and she's going to the gym, and she's doing a million things. So sometimes you actually have to dial back. Some people say, you know, you cut back a little so you, you could allow these muscles to heal. That happens too. Ergonomics, that's on the far right. So, you know, especially these days, I would imagine people working in their living rooms and uh, that uh, uh, with the computers, with their stations not being as fantastic. So that's where I could, if I have a federal employee, then I can write a prescription and any doctor can. And you can ask your doctors to do an ergonomic evaluation. I don't know what the wait list is now, um, but, you know, sometimes just your chair. But a lot of things you could do in your, uh, on your own. You could look up ergonomics of a workstation. There's a number of websites. I didn't want to put anything specific right now. You know, just looking at your computer, how your hands are sitting. There are some ergonomic keyboards and using the mouse on the right or on the left. You can switch a mouse to the left. Um, and uh, I've done that. I, I trained myself to do both hands both sides, because um, sometimes you it's harder to mouse with uh, the right hand, and you can use the left. So things like that. And then, as you see on the bottom left, I think one of our audience, I'm pretty sure, is Isabella Claire. She is the amazing nurse who worked with me in some research we're going to talk about. And she said when she, and she has been doing, uh, she did counseling in the Briere family health team, using the sheet as part of her uh, program to help people and counsel them in their pain problems. So sometimes she said, you know, Hillel, I put a little sticky on the far left uh, uh, middle aspect uh, to, so you don't want to distract people. So there's other things that can affect, worsen, aggravate uh, painful conditions. And this is just list these things to make them just sounds like smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, life in general, financial problems, stress, anger, fear, nightmares, history of physical abuse, sexual abuse. Sometimes it's the only time that people have been asked about abuse. And sometimes they may start to cry just from looking at this sheet. And here's the anger at the guy who hit Jennifer because we talked about that um, uh, uh, perceived injustice syndrome and the fact that her husband just lost his job and that's causing stress in terms of finances for the family. What can those things do? Well, that's on the bottom. So that's like, how can stress affect, worsen, aggravate or cause pain? That's what we're talking about when people are generally calling, calling the mind-body connection, even though there's many parts of that. Adrenaline is squeezed into the bloodstream. Your heart rate increases. Your muscles tense up. You sweat more. And people have been noted to, telling me more lately that, yeah, sweating, it's an interesting since his accent. Your pain increases and becomes more intense. I don't think that's only psychological. I think that's physical. When you're injured, any stress, therefore, that you feel and maybe from the insurance company or not being able to work as much and not being able to take care of your uh, injured, your older parent um, or your child, then that could actually worsen the injury, make the pain worse. So therefore the idea of relieving stress or dealing with some of the psychological and social factors to relieve pain is not just a bunch of crap, it's real. And it's actually at the level at multiple levels and both at the level of the mind, but at the level in, in my in my uh, studies and research at the level of the muscle ligament as well. So what are some of the treatments there? So pencil in some things, some counseling, some things to read, uh, some books to read, um, and uh, could have had things like, like my books in the library, we'll talk later, uh, well, not much. And uh, and you, sometimes writing your story, they're actually, you know, literary therapy. Sometimes all these feelings you have and you're dreaming about them and you're thinking about them, just get a nice book, get a moleskin, get something that's that's decent to, to write in and write it down, write down. Even some of those things about physical and sexual abuse, what, 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 what was going on there? Sometimes this is the first time it may come about. Doesn't mean that it's the cause of all of your pain. But it could mean that you should start talking about it now more with someone professional. Next slide, please, Antoine. So what does it do? So this pain explanation and treatment diagram, having the sheep, it's not like a miracle, but it sort of gets you to focus. You remember a little bit more about what you're doing, what you plan to do. There's a plan that doctors and added a lot of people are getting now, nurse practitioners, and I 
give a similar kind of lecture to nurse practitioners now at the University of Ottawa, something to have that's physical, that the pain clinician treatment diagram to then go to transport between your physiotherapists and show them. Your symptoms are real. The pain risk factors can maybe improve them or they could be aggravating them. Next, please. So then we thought, okay, so how do we translate this and to look at chronic, some aspects of chronic pain, chronic muscle pain into the family medicine because it shouldn't be only um, a uh, specialty physiatry type thing. So um, Homer Simpson is always good for, for uh, to introduce something. So this is, uh, next slide, please. This is just one slide of a, you know, an entire a lecture on the research that Isabel Leclerc and myself and uh, Ms. Asefa, she was a master student, as you see, she's the first author. And as they say, it takes a village to do good research. Dr. Maga, she's a family doctor, instrumental in helping us get this research going. Dr. Dianandan is that guy you often see on uh, CBC and in the radio, and he talks about COVID, but he's a, uh, uh, an epidemiologist. And Dr. Godbo, an amazing physiotherapist who got his PhD and was part of our research team, instrumental in getting this research paper in the Canadian Family Physician, and you could all see it if you just type in um, chronic, uh, chronic pain management in family medicine. And this is just our only slide, as I said, there's many other slides, but basically we showed that if Isabel uh, um, a nurse could get referrals from other family doctors in her clinic, which we know is not that always easy to do because not everyone has a family health team, but in a family health team in which there are some nurses and some therapists, that what happens? Pain does decrease and people who are on opioids start removing some of their own opioids because some of the things that Isabel has shown them in terms of questionnaires and goal management actually helps them manage their pain and their pain risk factors. Next slide, please. We're doing really well in terms of time and in terms of um, being able to answer some questions at the end. So this comes from one of the earlier slides and I was actually talking to some family doctors, I think. And I thought, well, look, so what are, what are some of the messages? I think like, you know, we all need in our life scripts things that we can um, say to our, our loved ones, maybe our wives, our husbands, our children, things that little things in our head to be able to um, help us formulate our thoughts. So, so this is like a, a script that they sort of said to family doctors, what do we want? What kind of message do we want to convey here? So the message basically, the problem, because people get told, especially with muscle, ligament, pain, strain, um, you know, unless it's like a severe arthritis that needs surgery or a nerve injury, you know, the problem is not in your head, it's in your tissues. But maybe psychological and social problems can modify, delay, or worsen the healing and the recovery. And it's not in everyone. Of course, there's some issues. And uh, my mother may is, I think, is in the crowd here listening and you know, you can have spinal stenosis and other issues that these things may not be the, the primary thing. But let's try at some point to figure out what your pain risk factors are. Next. Thank you. And, and uh, to other, all the other healthcare professionals, you know, even physiotherapy, occupational therapy, psychology. And, and, I, and I actually even do say this when I gave a talk to psychologists, because sometimes because I think psychologists are not often working with fit medicine, and that's a problem with our system, that psychologists are not on, you know, OHIP or Medicare or BC care or, you know, like, uh, RAMQ, like in Quebec, that they're not always comfortable in saying how, how much social psychological factors may be uh, relevant. But if there were more working together between physician and psychology, and they felt comfortable in discussing those things. So then the concept with the idea would be, you know, just emphasize to the patient, the power of the mind to cope better. And uh, if you are doing healthier things, like we, even those aspects of the smoking, weight loss, or the exercise, that adopting healthy, uh, healthier coping strategies and trying to help your own self 
with any personal issue. And that's where maybe sexual abuse or physical abuse histories may be relevant, may not be, uh, could promote recovery at numerous biological levels, like even, we didn't have a chance to say that even veterinarians found that when animals were treated differently, then the quality of the bacon that was produced was better because they weren't scared before slaughter, which is a weird study to bring up, but I think everyone could relate to it. Better healing, better ability then to exercise, maybe better sleep, better recovery. Next, please. So to summarize, perfect time to have some questions after. Pain still could come from so many parts of your body, and uh, I'm never, I'm never, uh, um, I'm always learning. That's so many aspects and certain arthritis, and I'm sure there's some people with pain in the audience and saying you didn't cover my pain, uh, I didn't cover what I have, and that's a real challenge. And uh, who's the person that has an answer to everything? That no one really from doctor is a good ability to try to look at the big picture. And uh, sometimes you're going to have to really get digging in there and do some of your own research too, to get the right person. And so healing and recovery depends on many factors, the medical aspects, whether you're on the right drugs, you know, there's biologics these days, which are amazing for certain uh, uh, arthritis is like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic, which they need them. We, we, we need them. And, you know, they, they, can't be just cured with just physical therapy, but other f physical therapies can be amazing. And psychological, therefore, issues can be life-giving and social factors. And we know that even poverty and finances can play a role. Multidisciplinary care, which is part of the, we talked about with uh, with Isabella Claire in, in the something like the family medicine department, that we need that we 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 can't the day of a having just care of going into a solo practitioner and family medicine we I think well I'd say in my opinion we, that should be thrown out the window and being in an environment where there is some other people that can assist for a nurse some therapist to, that that's what we need but it's still not frequently av available in our current medical environments and figuring out yourself the more you can try to help yourself. By looking at your own PETD, and Antoine maybe could actually pass us uh, to have an individual uh, maybe slide uh, uh, available, Antoine, besides just having to pluck it out of the um, uh, talk itself. That may be something to do in the future. Um, and because uh, maybe then you could, because what we're doing, this used to be only a tool uh, that we would do in the clinic and teaching family doctors to do it. I think it may be. We, we have started to do that patients will fill it out themselves as much as they can so that they're even more prepared when they're going into the family doctor. So uh, next slide. So thank you uh, so much for inviting me. Yeah, this is my plug. So I did, uh, when my ideas were flowing out of my brain, it's, it's, over, it's over a decade now, I uh, went to a, a cabin somewhere and I sat down and, and wrote out some of the stories like of Jennifer and um, and multiple patients, of course, changing their names and changing some of the things. And that's what the book and it's available in um, the Audible Public Library. It wasn't in chapters. It was it was more it was a company in California that um, looked at uh, libraries more. But it's still um, uh, and maybe we could even release a couple of chapters if we want, Antoine. And but so this is uh, what it was called, what it looks like. And that's it. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Feinstone. We have a, a few questions uh, and I'll read them out. The first question, uh, I severely broke my ankle, compound open fracture of tibia and fibula 10 years ago. I have severe osteoarthritis, uh, which is uh, presenting when I overuse it, uh, along with swelling or pain with colder weather. Recently received a cortisone shot, which worked wonderfully for about a month. Uh, I've just filled a prescription with extra strength Voltaren cream. I can't see my surgeon until next summer. Uh, <laughs> is joint replacement surgery for an ankle now available? Or are so, there any other surgical interventions to receive, uh, to relieve worsening uh, symptoms? 
Okay, I think it's a little too specific for this type of talk, but yeah, but I think it is promising that you got in, improvement with an injection. What does that mean? You know, even though you had large amounts of, you say you had fractures and trauma, and it's interesting that an injection, which basically improves inflammation, that it really helps you. So that would mean that some of the pain that you're having is from inflammation, like there's a thing in the joint, which is called synovium, which is basically the lining of the joint. And so if that helps, that you could have another injection six months later that so that doesn't have to be the orthopedic surgeon it could be so usually you want you don't want to have more than two um a year so you could get your family doctor to refer you to say a radiologist some radiologists will do under guidance say of ultrasound they'll do an injection and now a lot of sports medicine doctors and even some of my own physiatrists who have practices in which they do injections they would be able to potentially do that so you would say to them i had this fracture it really helped. Uh, is it going to last long? The next time, it's probably unlikely. So other things, you're doing Motrin, you're gonna get a, you could get an ulcer, or you said Voltaren. The creams, if they help for you, good luck. You know, they it's they, they don't often help a lot, but if the cream does help for you, it's an anti-inflammatory. If it's close enough to the joint, so that's where thinner areas that the cream would go into the joint. Otherwise. Is there joint replacements? Yeah, you have to go. There's there, just like orthopedic surgeon becomes more and more specialized. So you'd have to go to a guy who does foot and ankle surgery. There's a couple of guys in Ottawa and they do do that sometimes. And they do do some procedures. So it's worth seeing them. They can do a fusion um, that of your of joint and they do that a lot. And that helps a lot of people. And the last thing is maybe footwear. As a physiatrist, you know, you're looking at not actually um, changing the joint, some footwear. If there, if you could r have a rocker sole, uh, then so if your foot doesn't have to move as much, it's ankle. So sometimes that's helpful. Like there's a company called Dansko. It's just commercial. It's go online, not cheap. It could be co cost 150 bucks, 100 bucks. But they have like a rocker sole, kind of like a clog type shoe, and that sometimes is is helpful to some of my patients with the problem you had. Um, thank you. The next question is, uh, I had a total knee replacement about two months ago. The knee is doing great, but I continue to have uh, significant thigh pain. Uh, it, it has been uh, severe enough to prevent sleep. Uh, it's not as severe now, but it continues. Uh, is this likely to continue indefinitely? I, once again, a, a specific one, but maybe um, the, the question about uh, will pain continue after uh, yeah. uh, a medical procedure? So again, it's so, you know, so I also in uh, just, just stopped doing, it's called uh, EMG electromyography. So you used to get this. So that's like sticking needles in people and finding out if there's nerve damage. So um, if it's, uh, if it's, so this, again, we're not here to be like, you know, individual, but still I happen to have the expertise. So there is a thing of numbness and tingling. You get great surgery. And if you type in numbness and tingling post hip surgery, you're going to find a uh, thing called Moralgia Parasthetica, uh, M-E-R-A-L-G-I-A, -E type it in yourself, and you'll see that the anterior approach, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a, such a great surgery, it saves people's lives to have hip surgery by putting a new joint. Unfortunately, it's a pretty common um, uh, um, sequela, uh, sort of um, result of hip surgery in which it gets tingling and numbness because when they are opening up the front of the hip, there's a, a little thin little nerve that supplies the sensation to the thigh. So look that up, tell that to your doctor. You can get a test called an EMG. It would be worthwhile to ask your doctor to send you for an EMG uh, or nerve conduction test that's done by physiatrists and neurologists at the hospital. And is there anything to do about it? Well, if it's just stretched during the surgery and not cut, which it mostly is, then since the nerve is about this long, and it's injured around your hip, it could take uh, like a year to get better. So there's still hope about getting better in that for that kind of problem. Terrific. We're getting short on time. I have one more question. Uh, yeah, we have some. Well, let's go to well, as many questions as we have. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, do you have? Uh, do you also have a private practice uh, besides working at Bruyere? And how many physiatrists are are uh, in private practice in the Ottawa area? So right now there are more and more private practices. There's uh there's all there are like this and there some of them are part with our department. I don't have a private practice outside now, so unfortunately, 
your, your family doc's not going to send to me right now because I'm doing so much stroke rehab and other things. But yeah, there's so there's, uh, there's Dr. in Ottawa, there's Dr. Lentini, there's Dr. McDonald, there's Dr. Davidson. There, there are you look at look up physical medicine and rehabilitation specialists. There are some in the community. Some of them are focusing on injection, which is good and not as good. But um, there's Dr. Mansour. Terrific, they're all pretty terrific doctors. They do try to look at both the mind and the body at the same time. Even if they're doing injection, they won't just do an injection if need be. The problem with injections these days is it's becoming such a focus and because it's kind of quick and in and out and family doctors are getting involved and they're not doing that art of diagnosis as much as they should. And uh, they'll say, we'll do to you a couple injections. We'll see if they help and send you on their way. And that's not exactly what you want. But yeah, there are some um, there are more and more. There used to be more academic physiatrists, but there are more in the community. Terrific. Okay, next question. Uh, what I'm hearing is that pain is real and the patient needs to acknowledge the various effects of pain and be aware, but I don't hear many solutions other than living with it. Is that correct? That is totally wrong. So you're, so guys, let's say you're totally wrong. Again, look at the pain explanation and treating diagram. So if there are some of those risk factors we said, and that 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 the losing weight will put some less weight on your joints, then that will make an impact on your knee. If we look at uh, getting some help with your sleep, and then it allows you to do more therapy, and then you really actually do go swimming and swim regularly, as Steve and I know is a good ex exercise, that it actually can improve muscle ligament health. It's not a bunch of BS that I've had patients and even personally that I had chronic, I had like shoulder pain for like a couple of years. And I, and, um, and, uh, and I went to some therapy and it was kind of like stiff. I had injured it before and I did swimming and I did various strokes and the shoulder pain basically went away after about three, four months of concerted movement. So I hope you didn't get that message and that, that there's nothing you could do. And then the ergonomics. And then the impact of some of those psychological and social factors can be huge, whoever's answering the asking the question. So I hope that you don't leave this room saying there's nothing I could do, that these are... I guess we could use the word, word bullshit, that we're not we're not going to use that word, but that that they have tremendous impact. Yes, there still are some specific diagnoses. I think it's good that people gave some specific things, like I have tingling and numbness and pain in my thigh after I had uh, uh, an interior approach hip uh, replacement, but still, there's all those other things as well. All right. How can an indi individual patient coordinate their own medical care team? Right. How can they? They can't and they shouldn't and they should be involved with uh, a, a, a care team. But it's it's tough. I, I'm not going to like sugarcoat the fact that it's it's there's a lot of terrible things going on out there, specifically that I have patients now like in my stroke rehabilitation, you know, they don't even have a family doctor. So, I mean. You know, it's six thousand, six million people in Ontario now don't have a family doctor. So if you, so one thing is that I sort of um, political level, an organization like yourself to advocate for that. You know, Lake Jane Philpot now is a has a, uh, a special uh, committee at the, at, apparently at the Ministry of Health level of the of the province of Ontario to advocate for having uh, a family doctor. But it's not only just a family doctor. It's looking at some of the things that we just talked about, a family doctor within some kind of some kind of care team. I, I, I wish I could say that that's so there are family health teams, which were funded about 20 years ago um, in Ontario, and they stopped funding about that time. And so some people, it's like there's a total discrepancy in the type of care, even like, for instance, in the province of Ontario, which some people go in and they have uh, a family doctor, and then they have a nurse that gets some counseling, they have some therapy, they have even some mental health support with social workers funded by the government. So it doesn't come out of the pocket of the family doctor. That's a problem. If a family doctor starts a practice, and they have to fund themselves a social worker, then it's pretty hard for them to do. So um, that's what we've got to advocate. We've got to be warriors in this thing that the con current concept of just having specialists out there and family doctors and specialists just saying, oh, the family doctor will take care of everything. It's not working and it's not effective. And we have to have that concept of, if one word, remember one word, multidisciplinary care. 
Otherwise, then you can look at some of the things on the on the pain explanation and treatment diagram and try to yeah, build your own care team by saying if you have some insurance through, say, your federal government that you could say, OK, so do I need a physiotherapist? Do I need so, you know, that concept of the psychologist may be something you never thought of. And that's where something you could go to your family doctor and say, you know, I just didn't know. I didn't think about the impact of 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 some aspects of my childhood or even aspects of things that happened after the accident. And I'd like to get some therapy. And, you know, you could be this very strong person and never mention anything to your family doctor that could be critical in you getting some of your own care. Um, next question. Uh, what do you think of uh, prolia? Pro prolia. So that's for you, osteoporosis. Not gonna. I, I think that's what they're talking about, right? I think that's a, a drug for osteoporosis. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, and uh, if, if that's you know that's where specialty care really becomes you know huge in medicine, and so that's where you know usually it's an endocrinologist or some rheumatologist that recommend it, and that's all we'll say about it. it's. Uh, it's um you, you, you got to get the data and it is hard to be a patient to get the data but hopefully they'll give it to you um i have a question here explain fibromyalgia pain but i think that's probably a long explanation yeah you know what i should have i should have even put it in there um fibromyalgia i, I give the lick so rheumatologists invented the word it means pain coming from your muscles and ligaments it's a big it's a syndrome of pain in which you can get really chronic pain in your neck and 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 it's real and it's kind of it's not it's kind of fallen out of favor because the the rheumatologists don't want to see it anymore. So they uh, uh, so other doctors have been seeing it. So basically, it's real. The myofascial pain syndrome may be similar. If if you have chronic pain and it's affecting your sleep and your health, then you could have fibromyalgia syndrome. Unfortunately, you do get some bad reactions from some doctors, kind of rolling their eyes. But it's real. Read about it and. It's, it's a good concept still. The concept of should we label fibromyalgia? So we, yeah, I, I think it's still important to, to know that. But some of the pain explanation treatment diagram things are the same. Looking at that holistic way of looking at health is even more important than fibromyalgia. Terrific. Um, how can we obtain the uh, pain risk factor form? Yeah, so uh, Antoine, could you answer if you could answer that? I think I think we could just pull it right off one of that slides. And um, Steve, maybe you'll, you'll say, how could you make that available? I think that'll be pretty easy. Yeah, we, yeah, we'll we'll be able to send it out in the follow up email that will go out later this afternoon. Thank you. I, and I appreciate you even asking for that. That's great. We want to, like, I, you'll see, you could just type in pain expression treatment. And there's two articles in what we call the peer reviewed. You know, that means it's a scientific journal. I, I, I it's, it's, so it's now being used in, it's actually being used in Singapore. And, but I, I want it to be used even more. It's in Singapore in a physiotherapy uh, clinic. It's being used in multiple small clinics um, across Ontario. And it may be used in places that I don't even know. So, um, uh, uh, that's a good thing that if you could, uh, you're, uh, you're, it's a good audience to be able to even look at it and get some feedback even to see how is it. We, we haven't had a, a tons of experience of people filling it out themselves before even going to their doctor or therapist. Uh, could death of a spouse, parent, etc., be a pain risk factor? I think, you know, whoever's answering that, asking that question knows the answer. And the answer is, of course. I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, just yesterday, two uh, sort of relevant people in, the, in in our family's lives had died, and and you see the different reactions of people, and um, you know, from getting physically sick to uh, to uh, you know contracting muscles and how they how you carry your body. So don't even think that not. Of course, it can, uh, and it doesn't mean that it's all in your mind again. So it means yes, there's that psychological component, but the how it could carry and affect your body chemistry and your muscles and ligaments. So of course, yes, the answer is yes. And that's why sometimes getting help, grieving, grief counseling may be the biggest answer, but it doesn't mean if you get better that your pain wasn't physical. Uh, have you dealt with patients with very tight jaws that resulted in physical pain in their groin? Jaws and groin. Mm. Uh, okay, so, okay. Uh, we 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 definitely we should have we could have talked about jaw pain. It's huge. Um, it's called temporal mandibular joint TMJ pain. 
I get it sometimes, uh, and it happens from clenching. And clenching is usually associated with what we know, anxiety and tension, and it's so common. Like, so if you ask your friends, I bet you like seven out of 10 have a, a mouth guard that they get from their dentist. You know, it's this thing that they put in your mouth and, it, and it's a good thing. It actually prevents you from clenching as much because it sort of puts a little space. So great thing, get a mouth guard. But then again, the idea is still, is there other aspects of um, uh, um, of clenching and your stress and anxiety that's leading to the, that oral pain? And it could be so bad that people could actually destroy their their joints with that TMJ joint. So you start off with muscle pain, you get TMJ pain, and then the joint gets destroyed. So it's still so that's a good a great example of how stress and anxiety leads to this horrible physical problem that sometimes they actually change the joint in the jaw. Uh, so, okay, so then groin pain. So maybe it's the same, maybe it's part of that whole uh, sort of syndrome that's going on that it's not really the joint pain in the jaw causing the groin pain, but it's sort of connected in some other way. Perfect. Uh, final question, and I think this is a really good one. Is there a list of books to read included in your book or can you make some recommendations? Absolutely. So that's great. And I, you know, I should have had that. So, 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 um, you know, so a classic book that people are going to see once they start looking into this thing is called The Mind Body Prescription, John Sarno. So that kind of really changed my life to a certain extent. And actually, uh, he's dead now. I, uh, my one thing, I, I did a sabbatical in New York and was able to sit in when he was kind of old already, John Sarno. And he's the guy, when you look at his book, it's still a huge bestseller because Howard Stern, the famous radio personality, and Anne Hathaway, uh, who was used to be a you know famous actress who's uh, Mel Brooks's wife, um, said that I read this book and my pain went away. So basically, that's a book of... Uh, um, how this this one physiatrist in New York, he basically just, anyone who would come in, uh, he would just say, I think your pain's in your mind. I don't think you have, you need a surgeon. And John Sarno would just say, it's tension, myositis syndrome. He was a bit of a one-trick pony, but still interesting to read. Hard, hard to read sometimes, this book, but good to read. Mind, body, prescription, definitely in the library. Okay, then there's my book. Uh, 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 get like scenarios. Then there's... Um, a bunch of books that you can look at on chronic pain and fibromyalgia. The library has a bunch. Then there's a new book by a guy called Al Alan Gordon, uh, The Way Out. Very interesting. Um, he has an Instagram account. Uh, Dr. He's, a, he's, a, he's actually a social worker. Um, he's made a huge name for himself. Um, basically saying that um, the pain that you're feeling is not... It's not, he's saying that it's not really in your muscles. So this is where it doesn't really matter, I don't think. It's still worth reading the book. I think it's good. And there, and some of the podcasts by Dr. Gordon interviewing another guy, is his, his partner or something or business partner is worth it. The way, I think it's called The Way Out. And um, just, uh, so saying uh, that the, it's not physical uh, and um, and yet, but looking at uh, at the pain is not dangerous you know, there's these testimonials and people talk and like, you know, I had pain for 16 years and I did the program with Dr. Gordon uh, or and, and my pain went away completely. So it's worth reading, though. And all these things just show that there's so many factors that may be involved, but a good read. And there's so many other books that we could uh, name, uh, but I think you should look in there, look at some podcasts. And those are just a smattering of a couple. All right. That's the end of our questions. So thank you very much. And thanks for staying on uh, a few uh, minutes extra to uh, to answer the questions that our uh, that our participants uh, posted. Best part. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Feinstone for today's uh, informative session. It's uh, it was terrific. Also, to everybody, remember to uh, look out for our follow up email. We'll include uh, a link to the uh, video uh, and we'll also include the uh, the uh, the, the pain management form, uh, see if maybe we can get a, a reading list together. Um, and it will also include information how to access the video and more information on our mega recruitment drive. So once again, thanks, Dr. Feinstone, and thank you everybody for coming out today. Great, thank you.